we put together a presentation um, based on our experiences over the last several years, at least the last five years. Um, the school, uh, all of our students have multiple disabilities, complex medical uh, conditions, and um, the way that we were doing transition uh, it really hadn't hit on everything that we needed to uh, pay attention to. So um, uh, we've, we've cr we put together a committee. Um, again, Julie and Hadley are in that committee as well as myself. And we wanted to, um, uh, t uh, was just put together a, a, a good solid presentation. Um, number one for you, but number two, uh, for our school so that we can continue to expand our thinking around transition and how it relates to uh, setting those things forward for our students and what's most important for them. So, uh, did that go to the next one? Okay, I think I went over some of this. Uh, the presentation will explain how the multidisciplinary team at the School for Blind Children, how we developed the process for creating person-centered transition plans for graduating students. Uh, our transition planning process, uh, we're describing this process through this unique model and relate the real, tangible, positive outcomes for our young adult students who have benefited from this model. And again, it's me, uh, Hadley, and Julie. And I have to say, for, for them, they have a tremendous amount of education and experience. I have height. <laughs> so if you're thinking like, oh, what, Michael Jordan's height? But certainly not the skill or the, or the cash. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Hadley and Julie, uh, Julie's our school psychologist. Hadley is our, one of our occupational therapists. Uh, Diane Campbell is a physical therapist at the school. Uh, Danielle Waters is our school audiologist. Laura, Laura Barbieri is a physical therapist. And Lynn Fox, by a show of hands, you've heard of Lynn Fox before. Dr. Grimm probably has. Um, she is, I think this is her second year at the school. Uh, she worked for Patton, and now she's our director of professional development. And she used to work at the school years ago, so we're certainly, it's our benefit that we have her with us. A little bit about the school. Our on-campus program, we have 200 students enrolled from 33 counties, which is equivalent to 242 school districts. So <clears throat> as far, so we're in Pittsburgh, as far east as the Altoona area, as far north as Erie, and certainly below Allegheny County, there's Washington, Westmoreland, Fayette, Green counties. Uh, so we 33 counties in Western Pennsylvania. The other half is served by uh, Overbrook School for Blind. Uh, we serve students 3 to 21, both day and residential. We have about 20 to 25 residential students at the school. They don't stay seven days a week. We have, they come in on Sundays, um, and then they go home on Fridays. And also for uh, time off from school, summer um, break, uh, holidays and so forth. Uh, we're right in the middle of our three-week extended school year. Uh, all of our students uh, have multiple disabilities, including visual impairments or deaf blindness. Uh, a high percentage of our student population utilizes ad adaptive equipment to assist with mobility, uh, communication, and feeding. 75% of our students enrolled complete their education at the school. The other 25%, of course, uh, usually like when they're graduating from preschool and then they're going into kindergarten, then they move back to their uh, home school district. Uh, other programs at our school, uh, LAVI, Learning Adventures for the Visually Impaired, actually a, a parent of a student of ours that had graduated uh, and is now in our adult program, uh, penned the name for for that, uh, for the, our adult program. Um, we have, I think, maybe eight to 10, I don't know, maybe 10's maybe exceeding it, but we have about eight of our former graduates in that program and hoping to expand. Uh, we also have an outreach program. 
The outreach program uh, conducts evaluations and consultation. Uh, they also do uh, multidisciplinary evaluations, including functional vision evals, uh, cortical visual impairment range assessment, that's what CVI stands for, and vision assistive technology. The outreach program also provides direct services for our students uh, through early intervention, through school aged, and they also provide direct services at home or in that child's neighboring school district. Okay, so transition planning and how it looked for the old way, the old way that we used to do it. And I started uh, with transition planning back in 2011, except you know, I've been in this field for over 20 years, um, had worked on adult transition plans and uh, kids in school and, and moving into adult services. So uh, in 2011, I was more formally trained uh, with Indicator 13, and uh, we went, um, you know, what I was trained in was, was this grid. Everybody knows you've seen this in the IEPs, of course. Um, so my responsibility as the transition coordinator and, and all of yours who do this, whether you're teachers or transition coordinators, um, is to put the information in, um, also work, we worked on the parental concern sections and of course the present uh, levels uh, related to current transition goals section and it was what it says up there, it was we were providing the information, we were compliant, and procedurally correct, but it really wasn't enough. And so for the next few years, I was thinking to my, like, how can, how can this be better? How can this be better? And for, for one person just to pull it all together, it, it got somewhere, but it didn't get far enough. Um, so we had to think about that. It was compliant, it was procedurally correct, but we really didn't have the substance to reach the transition grid goals. And so we had to step back and look at what needs to happen. And thank goodness, a better way came up. Um, and that was uh, Lynn Fox and Molly Black uh, approached the school because one of our students who was deaf blind in 2014, his mom had approached us uh, or approached Patton and the Deaf Blind Collaborative and said, I really want to do this program that is going statewide and, and multi-state. So it, it was, of course, um, when it was brought to our attention, uh, we were like, well, uh, we don't really know if that's going to be helpful to us. Uh, little did we know that it was going to be uh, tremendously important for us and, and our goal to, to move from where we were uh, to the better way. So it, it did get to where we were thinking we need to do something different. Uh, the initial process of the multi-state collaborative uh, was OSEP directed. Um, the New York DeafBlind Collaborative developed and led the ITTI, the Interdisciplinary Transition Team Initiative and the multi-state collaborative uh, focused on students who require the most intensive service coordination. Has anybody uh, done the ITTI program before or have heard of it? Okay. Uh, and the research supported that we needed to be more planful to facilitate successful transition uh, transitions for our students who are deaf blind. And then the uh, PA's DeafBlind project contacted the school to participate in that. Hi everyone. Um, as Craig mentioned before, my name is Hadley Dean um, and I'm an occupational therapist at the School for Blind Children. So when the um, ITTI model first came to us, um, we tried to just really stick to the model that we were given from Patton and the model that they had sort of also inherited from the New York Deaf Blind Collaborative. Um, and so what ITTI really was at its core was a systematic approach to support the IEP transition teams to help link what is going on in school up until 1821 
to all of those post-secondary resources that we know that our students need and able to be successful. Because like Craig mentioned, the students that we have and the students that we serve at the school are incredibly medically complex. They have a lot of needs and are going to need support through pretty much every aspect of their daily lives. And so how do we help bridge that gap between what we are doing while they're in school and what are the services, all the services that the students sort of innately have as school-aged individuals to then what do they have and what will they need and how are they getting it once they transition to adulthood? Um, so some of the different tools that were utilized as a part of this ITTI model um, involved an ITTI transition planning timeline. Um, we used the PATH approach to help guide the person-centered planning, um, which was then ultimately sort of the overall um, plan that we were using to guide everything else that we did as a part of the process. Um, out of that person-centered plan came all of our different target areas that we were then going to work through as a team to help realize and achieve those different goals. Um, and we also used a lot of action planning within um, each of the different meetings that we had because this really helped make use of all of the individuals that were present already on this child or this individual's team through school and even the community resources available, family supports and resources, um, by pulling everybody into a meeting together, a person, a face-to-face -face meeting, an in-person meeting, where we could then talk about all of these different needs and work through how are we going to divide up these different um, goal areas and break it up into tangible, achievable actions that we could then assign to different people so that it was actually feasible that we would really achieve a tremendous amount um, of planning and successful implementation for these students in a really short amount of time. So this is um, an example of the transition planning timeline that I just referenced. Um, so we all know that technically speaking, um, transition planning is legally mandated according to um, IDEA and looking at the IEP to start at the age of 14. Um, but we really, what we really like about this grid is that it actually starts even earlier. And there's not even really like a bottom to the grid. The arrow is pointing all the way down to even younger and even before the age of 14, where we're thinking about how can we start bringing all of these transition planning needs um, into focus at an earlier age, so that way it's um, more of an achievable end goal by the time the student is reaching 18, 19, 20, 21. We don't have this entire page worth of different action items that we have to cover in one, two, three years, but instead if we start thinking about it earlier, it's really very easy to achieve a couple of these different goals every year, and then over the course of that student's career, um, they're gonna have a really nice whole program of supports and services built into a network around them so that whenever it's coming into those final years of school age, we can really focus on what they need most or what is still outstanding and make sure that we get that into place. Um, so some of the different notable things you can see on this grid, I know it's a little hard to see here. We did have um, some copies of a handout here, uh, but also we'll just talk through this a little bit. So starting as young as age 12 and 14, and really ideally even earlier, this is where we're starting to think about some of those, um, like helping to families just be aware of and to register for um, different community or county-based supports. Um, so looking at even supports coordination and also thinking about um, the social and recreational component of our students and our children's lives and how we can make them more full, help broaden their social network. Um, so even thinking about different like camps that might be available, different um, community resources or support groups, either for the student or for the parents. Um, and then continuing up as we kind of climb up through the ages, seeing that maybe things become a little bit more focused on those more um, key core aspects that are going to be needed for um, just daily living activities. Um, thinking perhaps about um, employment or work assessments, thinking about um, different like transportation services, all of those key places, where is the funding going to come from for all of that? And so each one of those um, different topics, if you think about it, it's huge in and of itself. And yet whenever we're talking about this for just one student, all of these different pieces need to come together and they all need to magically be in place by the age of 21. And so how do we help 
families to achieve all of these different goals and to get all of these different services in place in a more, um, in a less panicked sort of way so that we're sort of spreading it out and working on it slowly over the course of that student's career. Um, so then as I referenced another, um, the way that we tried to come up with our person-centered plan for the ITTI process was through the PATH approach. Um, so this was where we were fortunate whenever we were following the ITTI model really closely. Um, we had support from um, Patan coming in, and so it was really nice to have sort of some third-party moderators to help us go through this PATH approach because they were able to kind of ask the tough questions, uh, maybe ask the questions that might make everybody a little bit uncomfortable, um, bring up the topics of, okay, so here's where you want your child, you want your child to live with you, but what are you going to do, say, when you're not able to care for them anymore? Um, and so that was nice to have that third party who then the family didn't necessarily see again in the process, but it was sort of, they could ask the tough questions and have some of that um, almost like weight on them, whereas then we as a team kind of didn't have that on our shoulders and could start fresh from there. But then also, as we'll talk about kind of later on in the process, now we're doing all of this in-house, and that has been both a struggle and I think an area of strength that we've developed is how do we as a school team really quickly connect with families to ask those tough questions so that we can achieve the goals that are really needed. But so when we're thinking about this PATH approach, it stands for Planning Alternative Tomorrows with Hope. So there are eight steps to it. Um, the first and main step is really thinking about like, what is your North Star? What does this child, what does this family want for this child so that this child can live a successful, healthy, full life? Um, again, for many of our students, they are um, extremely medically complex, um, require a lot of care. So for our students, the main... Um, people making the decisions for our students about their lives are really going to be their parents or their siblings. Um, in the end, very few of our students are able to talk or use really a consistent communication means. Um, so it really does come down to the family and to also the school team who knows this child really, really well to help make some decisions about like what is going to make this child happy in the future? How are we going to help this child live a full life? Um, so that after we've identified some of those sort of key elements or the North Star, we want to start to think about what are the different goals that we need to have in place to get us there. From there, we take a step back and think like, okay, so if that's where we need to be, where are we now? And so this is what's really getting to the crux of that whole transition planning piece of where are we now and where do we need to go? Um, we want to think about different people that we can enroll for support. So again, bringing all of these different members of the team together so that we can all work together towards these common goals. Um, we want to recognize ways to build strength. So based on where we are now and what we already have in place, what can we use as a stepping stone to get to the next level? Um, as I referenced before, we were really big on action planning. So actually thinking about what are our steps for our short-term goals that are going to help us get to our long-term goals. And then we always um, had meetings in person, face-to-face. -face. And so we would end our meeting by thinking about what is next month's work going to look like. Um, and then also with the PATH process, it's committing to the first step. So having everybody on that team really agreeing to this is where we are, that's where we want to be, here's how we're going to get there, and we're starting today. Um, so these are just some examples. We used, we're fortunate to have a large space where we put big sheets of craft paper up on the wall. And so we were able to write and to draw, and it was sort of a living document while we were all there meeting, having this conversation. Um, and I think that that was really nice for helping to visualize some of this and helping to get everybody engaged. Um, so as you can see, we're actually, um, where we really started the conversation was actually over here, more on the right side of the paper, talking about the goals, the North Star, what are our dreams for this child as they transition out of school? Once we established what our dreams are, what our ultimate goal is, we actually went back to the left side of the screen where we then talked about where are we now? And then everything in the middle was thinking about those different steps that I just mentioned of, okay, so how do we get from where we are now to where we want to be? Um, what are the people that we need to enroll? What are the different strengths that we have that we can build upon? Um, what is our first step based on where are we now? And then also what's our short-term plan here? Um, so this was an example for one of the students. Um, 
This one looks pretty different, but was another example of a different student. Um, so again, you can see on the left just sort of where are we now in November 2016 and where do we want to be one year from now in November 2017. Um, so you can see that this there were a lot of um, dreams and goals that came up. And then for through the rest of the grid, there wasn't very much. So already we could kind of see very quickly like, uh-oh, a little bit. What, what are we going to do? We have to get the rest of this filled in so that we can get there based on where we are now. Um, and then that is where um, I'm happy to say that we were all able to work together. For this student, actually took more. Um, we worked for two school years, and we really did get there by the end. Um, so again, this is another one of those tools that I mentioned, um, thinking about target areas of transition planning. Um, so this grid is also nice and just kind of helping you to kind of get the the wheels turning to think about these different areas that are going to be important for transition planning. Um, when we transition plan for our students, we have to really think about every aspect of their lives. Um, and so that's where this grid can be really helpful in thinking about communication, um, all different types of assistive technology, orientation and mobility. We work um, at a school for blind children. So thinking about um, for our students who might be more independent travelers, what is that going to look like? But then also for our students who um, rely upon wheelchairs for mobility, how are they going to get around into the community, into medical appointments, a day program? Um, thinking about areas of independent living skills and any job exposure, or even thinking about the experience that they might have had already or experiences that they could have. Um, then moving into some of almost those higher level um, like life fulfillment aspects of self-advocacy and self-determination, um, helping to identify the self, so how, and like recreational and social networks. These are, these are the things that are going to make our students' lives be full as they move beyond school, so that way they're not um, just staying at home every day, but have a robust social network like they do whenever they're at school with peers, um, or have a good sense of self, are engaging in activities that they enjoy, have a varied, um, day-to-day -day life and are happy and fulfilled individuals as they're moving through the rest of their lives. Um, in looking at this as well, this kind of helped us to think about um, some of the different key players that are involved in our students' lives. So as you can see from this grid, it goes from birth all the way up to 22 plus. Over the course of our students' lives, the different key players that are involved really does evolve and change, and the list just grows and grows and grows. Um, there are really very few people who are going to be present in our students' lives early on that are then in not in some way or another going to still be relevant down the line. Um, so one of the key things that I want to point out here as well is that as we are thinking about um, transitioning our students from school age resources or from under 21 resources, also keeping in mind the aspects of um, medical care and how we're going to help transition our children from pediatric Medicare, medical providers and specialists to adult providers. Um, that's another conversation that we found is really important to have with families, but can also sometimes be a little bit difficult. Well, I've had my PCP since you know so-and-so was born. What? What do you mean we have to stop going to that PCP? And for many, um, you, you will simply because of insurance. And so starting to have that conversation and help parents think through that, so that way it's not the, their child has turned 21 last week, the child now has a cold, they call the PCP, and the PCP's, sorry, can't help you. Then, then what does a parent do? So helping the parent to think through some of that. Um, and then ultimately, too, when we're thinking about these key players, we want to try to help the parents realize that after school, the family and the parents and the caregivers, they are then going to become the key players in the students' lives. I think a lot of times families, as they should, rely really heavily on the resources present in their child's school to help them navigate the different social services and different medical services that their student, that their child needs. Um, but helping the parents to kind of realize and face the facts that after 21, after school, we're not there anymore. And so they're going to need to take over all of those roles in, able, in order to help their student be successful. Um, so this is an example of a completed action plan um, from one of our meetings. Um, so this was from just one meeting in October of 2015. So you can see each different line item is a different action item. 
each action item kind of says what exactly what needs to happen. We then assign it to one of the people on the team. So when relevant, it might go to somebody who's sort of um, is like the relevant professional for that goal, but also not always. And that's really one of the beauties of the ITTI process is that by having all members of the team equally engaged, everybody can participate in any aspect of transition planning. Um, we also are really careful to set a goal date. So when do you need to have this step done by? So it might not always be our next meeting, but it's probably going to be within a month or two, say. And then at our next meeting, we're going to pull out this completed action plan at the start of the meeting and look back and say, okay, so so-and-so, you were supposed to call that camp. Did you do it? If so, what was the outcome? And then either if it's complete, great, what's our next step? And if it's still outstanding, okay, that's fine, but then how can we support you to um, get that step completed for our next meeting? Or what are the roadblocks you're running into? So... Um, as we, after we followed the sort of pure ITTI model that we were given for a couple of years um, at WPSBC, we then started to tailor it a little bit more so that we could more feasibly um, go through this process with more of our graduating students. Um, we also, our students aren't um, all deaf blind. And so some of the different aspects of the ITTI model where it came from the New York Deaf Blind Collaborative um, didn't necessarily as perfectly aligned with the needs of all, of all of our students as we felt like it could. So then we started to make some adjustments to it and sort of personalize it to make it our own transition planning process. Okay, so I wanted to take you a little bit through that story again. Um, as far as how we went from just filling out boxes on the IEP, whereas the transition planner who was responsible for um, all of everything that had to do with the transition process to becoming involved with the um, Deaf Blind Project and then ultimately taking that and making it our own. So the first few kids up here you're gonna see are kids who went through the Deaf Blind Project through the ITTI model. Um, and this is Jacob who we started when he was 15. We have Hannah, who we started when she was eight. And then we have Kirby, who we had the last two years of his schooling to prepare for. So again, these were all kids that were going through that Patan model, and it really gave us a chance to learn um, all those steps and, and just having the action plan. But we really wanted to take it a step farther and make it our own. Um, so this past year, we took on kids who were not deaf blind that still had the multiple disabilities, but just the visual impairment piece and not the hearing impairment piece. So we have Isaiah, Jessica, and then Scott. Um, you'll be hearing about Scott later on in the presentation. He's someone who came to us um, in his mid-teens, and we were able to take his family through the process for um, the last two years of his schooling. So again, we have these key players and we keep talking about like this big shift and we're really looking for a shift in the roles of going beyond your traditional role in the school and making this team and stepping outside of things that you would normally do within your job duties and expanding. Um, and again, this, the idea of this came from that Patan model. But the other shift that we're looking to see is going from that school team where we are just completely in the IEP to shifting to the parent, to shifting to the outside service provider. So we want this to go as seemingly, like just as good as possible to um, those outside social service providers by um, pulling them into meetings and really talking through what we've been doing for the child as a team all these years. So we touched on this before. One big, big component of this is that building the rapport. And we really want the parents to feel comfortable because you're really asking them to expose themselves. 
um, you're asking them, what is your dream for your child and what is your biggest fear? Um, and we did this mostly through the face-to-face -face meetings. We found that setting up meetings on a monthly basis that lasted about two hours long um, really, really helped um, make those really good relationships. And especially with the ones that we started when they were younger, we were able to carry those relationships through um, to the next IEP team. They just felt more comfortable. Um, when you start when you're eight years old thinking about these things, then when you're 21, you're not in panic mode. Um, so again, we, we're really interested in what support system do they already have. We found with one student they were, um, the family had some religious beliefs that they wanted their child to have funding and be on these wait lists, but they didn't want to take away from other people. So they felt like if someone else on the wait list got something before them, they felt like that was okay, that they had their religious community and that they didn't want to take away from someone else. So in, in that instance, we really um, had to step away from, from our thoughts as an IEP team of like, Let's, let's call, let's get to the top of the list, let's get that funding, and just being really aggressive to, you know what, the parents wanna take a different approach. Um, and that's something that we probably wouldn't have known had we have not had those multiple meetings in person with them. Okay, so we kind of are breaking it down here to the absolute essential needs that we want to leave parents with and then um, some supplemental supports where it'd be nice for them to have. So one big thing that we've found is that parents don't understand waiver funding or where you go with the funding or if you get one funding, it might not cover what you want. So really understanding what they want early on helps you find the funding for it. The other one is the plan for guardianship, which again, um, no one might have ever brought up to them. Um, and as Hadley touched on, that move from your pediatric doctors to the adult doctors and specialists. Um, transportation's another big one. They've relied on the school busing system for so long, and they now need to get their own vehicles um, with the handicap support or um, get access. We also have the assistive technology piece. Um, a lot of people don't realize that whenever their child did have assistive technology through the school, that the school owns the speech generating device um, or the hearing aids. And whenever they graduate, they don't necessarily get to take that with them. So we want to make sure we set them up so that when they leave, they have something that they can use. And we want them to register with the Office of Developmental Programs and the Office of Long-Term Living. Um, and they, they need that information that the e, EPSDT ends um, at 21 because that's something that, again, they might not be aware of, um, that one day their child's 21 and these supports will go away if you don't set up something differently. All right, so for supplemental supports, we have, we want them aware of foundations. Um, for our population, the Helen Keller um, National Center has been a huge help to us. Um, any kind of support groups, whether that be online or in person, um, whatever one meets their individual needs. Um, summer camps are another thing that we often find for um, that people might not even know are available, might need some help setting that up. And um, last but not least, we um, want them to be aware of pre-employment opportunities. Okay, so here's some things that our school has in-house. Um, the first thing that we have is the Lion's Den, which is set up like a dollar store. Um, there's three or four aisles of things that are under $5. Um, we have balloons, coffee, and um, this is a store that the staff and students can make purchases at. We have a lot of staff. Um, obviously, we have you know speech, PT, OT, O&M, behavior specialists, teachers, um, Paris. So they are getting a good amount of business. Um, so here you see a student setting up 
um, at the front end of the store, and she's our greeter. So when people enter the store, she's pressing her device, which has a pre-recorded message, saying what the daily specials are. And here we have another student. He is putting the price tags on items. And then we mentioned Scott earlier. Um, part of the store has a, a little adjacent room to it um, that we call our print and copy shop. So this is an area where you can um, order invitations and posters, um, business card. Scott here, he's making um, the little punch cards for our cafeteria. We also have a greenhouse, which is completely beautiful. And it, it's part of a horticulture program we do where all the students are able to um, plant flowers, watch them grow, take care of them. And then on Fridays, the students um, sell them to the students and staff. This is our expendable supply window. So if you need paper, envelopes, staples, um, you go to that window. And we usually have a student set up there um, to take your order. And then they go in the back. They bag them up for you. And um, it's a great program. All right, this is our student apartment. It's set up like a dorm area. So this is where our students go to um, learn how to cook simple meals. Um, another part of it is we have beds. So we unmake the beds and they practice making them again. We have a house plant that they can learn to take care of. They work on vacuuming. Um, there's a washer and dryer, a dishwasher. So we're really looking at those um, activ activities of daily living skills. And last but not least, we have students who restock the cafeteria condiments. Um, so again, like I said, we have lots of staff. They're coming through every day. Um, and this is an, an area that um, needs restocked after um, the end of the lunch period. So we also look for the students that you know, it would be appropriate for the community-based assessment um, with our outside agency providers as well. Um, so as I was saying earlier, you really want to make sure that whatever they identify their hopes and dreams as, you have the funding to back it up. So we want to match the correct waiver with whatever um, postgraduate um, options they're picking. That, I'll pass it off to Craig. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So with the new way um, of transition planning, we needed to look at what current stakeholders were involved in that child's life or that our students' lives and um, come together as a team and decide who else needed to be involved. Uh, I'm sure all of you do that as well. You connect your students with various community supports and services and you look for what's going to make, what's going to make sense for them. So some of the examples that uh, we included up on the screen uh, that especially this, this past year as well, that we had a lot of heavy um, support from for our student was the Bureau of Blindness and Visual Services. Has anybody heard of that program before? Have you used them before for anything? You have. So you have a student who is vision impaired? Okay. Um, they were super great. It was, uh, the uh, BBVS is a, is a division of the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation. So that was the 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 off uh, the bureau that we would that we it just made sense for us to go to um, uh, for support for our students. So we again we educated the parents, uh, we educated each other um, on what they could provide, and they educated us on what they actually can provide. So uh, they were a huge support to Scott um, over the last couple years, but especially more so this past uh, school year. Um, Blind and Vision Rehab Services of Pittsburgh. Christy, I'm, so you're from Pittsburgh area, right? Yeah. You're from class? Yeah. Okay. 
I was right. See that? Um, I saw you earlier. I said she's from class. Uh, uh, Blind and Vision Rehab Services of Pittsburgh uh, is a provider. They, you know, just like anywhere else, they have a, 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 a whole menu of different types of services that they can provide. Um, they have day programs. Uh, they provide community-based assessments. So we, we utilized uh, that program as well. But the reason we did was because the uh, vocational rehab counselor from BBVS uh, actually got that off the ground for our students. So that was, that was a really good resource to go to. We've also collaborated, uh, let me start that over. We collaborated with adult day programs, uh, supported living facilities such as um, community homes, uh, intermediate care facilities for individuals with intellectual disabilities. Uh, also very critical are supports coordinators and service coordinators, they came in as well. Um, the therapy, the therap our therapists at the school and families work a lot with uh, durable medical equipment providers. So another uh, entity that I think with the conversations that we've had, the education that we've been provided through the ITTI model, um, pull in everything so that when you're planning for your child or the youth or your student to move from school to adult services, that we have everything together, or as close together as we could possibly get. So not to um, minimize any particular agency or service, that everything is important for that child's transition. And also we've utilized private and charitable organizations or other funding sources. So, <coughs> excuse me, this is, as you saw, Hadley uh, had the action item list when we were um, uh, initially going through that with, uh, who, it was Hannah, it was Jacob, and it was Kirby. Uh, we used that action item list to, to document um, various action items and important areas uh, for us to focus on. And this, that was where everything would come together. But with the shift a little bit of then getting the training, we wanted to do it in-house. So this is where everything comes together, uh, blending what was discovered about the family's biggest dream and worst fear. Uh, it was put on the, uh, the timeline activity. So for Scott, for example, and I had actually some more, but because of time, I'm gonna skip that. But for the, for the first goal or the action item, and Hadley kept really good notes here, uh, it's, it was brainstorming ideas for Scott post-graduation and also for a work assessment. So we were working on that together instead of where it was just me and the, the, not the weight that fell on our shoulders as teachers or transition coordinators or parents or whoever, uh, therapists. Um, we needed to do this uh, all together. And that was the approach and that, that's what we found to be uh, really what we needed for our students. Because just having one person do this is you're, you're not going to get the full scope of uh, what that child needs to move from school to adult life. So um, uh, we, we certainly put those objectives, those uh, action items in, in good order with a lot of detail. So you'll see under the first one, um, a little bit about what we discussed at that meeting uh, in December of 2018, and then the action needed, uh, the date uh, for, uh, uh, we were projected that it would be uh, completed. Um, so it was important to have all of that information there. So that's where we shifted a little bit. We provided more uh, information into those action items. Um, number two, again, like Julie had mentioned, and, and uh, Hadley mentioned waiver funding and that student's individual support plan. Very critical pieces to talk about where was the funding coming from. You know, our students are at our school and probably at your schools and, and they have, you know, the right to an education from at early as three, of course earlier than that, but in the school age, and then moving on to 21. So that's 18 years of, um, you know, things are renewing and, and you're getting those services and they have a right to those services. 
Well, when they move, and as you know, they move into adult life, where's that funding going to come from? Where are those supports going to come from? Where are those therapies going to come from? Um, so waiver funding, the funding to support that child, uh, can't emphasize enough how important that piece is. Um, and we also talked about uh, blind and vision rehab services um, coming in to do a community-based assessment for Scott, which was successful. Hadley went out once, correct, Hadley? Um, and that was, that was really, uh, really awesome. Um, so some of the challenges, I'm going to roll through these again because of time. Um, and that's the first one, <laughs> the challenge of time. Uh, so uh, time was, was certainly a challenge for us um, initially because I think we, we, we tried, we, we did a lot at the beginning and then we realized that we, with the experience with continuing to do this type of model that we could get a lot done um, but we had to set the time and, and set a dedicated amount of time. Uh, ongoing en engagement. We needed to continue to communicate with one another, communicate with the family, communicate with the student, um, communicate with outside providers, uh, so on and so on. And then emotional topics would come up and, and we really need to sit back and, and be active listeners and listen to what the student was saying, if they could speak or by their actions, um, but in, Importantly, what the family was saying, what they wanted to do, and as Julia mentioned about uh, Kirby's family, um, they taught us a lot because we had we were pushing so much. You got to do this. You got to do that. You got to go here. You got to go there, and they were like, "Whoa, wait, we can't. That's not how we are." So instead of us imposing our own values on them, we had to listen, and that was a, it. Was a great learning opportunity, and we took full advantage of that. So now we. We certainly cha we've changed things up and have done things differently. And again, when something goes wrong, you change it up, you move on. You don't just keep getting stuck. It's a plot twist, you just move on. So we've learned to do that as well instead of like constantly going over and over and over something. Let's just move on to something else. Um, and then when plan A falls through, have those backup plans. Uh, what steps can we take to make uh, plan A work in the future? So we had to back up and you know, have the backup plans, but then think about, all right, if we're going to have plan A, how can we make it uh, successful in the future? Um, again, explore new outside resources and establish and root those relationships with those outside resources. Um, funding problems. Certainly everybody has run into that. Um, communicate with people who represent those 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 youth, those children, those or students um, in their communities. So we've also looked at uh, uh, alternative funding and grants uh, to resolve some of the funding problems. Uh, disagreements over the next step, they, they come up. Um, but we have to understand that we can agree to disagree. Um, all parties want what is best, but certainly letting the, the student family uh, direct uh, the, the next steps. And of course, the mystery of you don't know what's out there unless you make that call, write that email, you know, connect with that agency. What's the worst that's going to happen? I think what we tend to have happen is we're like so anxious that something bad is going to happen on the other end, or you're going to get the not right answer that you want. But you don't know until you make that call, until you make that connection. So. Um, and, and I think particularly for parents, regardless if it's our students at the school or you know, us as parents or loved ones or whatever, um, can be a little challenging and, and nerve wracking. So um, helping the, the parents connect with those resources, I think, um, helps them then become that entity that they can move from. But I think starting early not just the last couple years, I think preparing them even at the beginning of that child's educational career that this is what you're planning for and this is what we're going to help you do. And that's, that's certainly important, something that we um, continue to work on. Uh, connect with supports and service coordinators, as I had mentioned earlier, and establish relationships. Going outside your comfort zone takes more time and effort, but it's worth it. It's definitely worth it in the end. 
So we're just going to kind of, we might come back to this if we have a quick second, but we have a couple of videos from um, some parent testimony. So thinking about Scott's mom, um, we have after um, this year she was going through it, we invited her in for a quick interview and we have um, some short video clips from her. So the question she was asked in this video was, if teams can only focus on a few tasks, what should they prioritize? one um, because there's so many things but I would think you know set some goals and be flexible because if you can't maybe reach those goals exactly how you might envision be flexible enough to know that you can but you have to have a roadway right. in mind that you can go to and even if you can achieve some of those it's going to open up to other roadways and branches Absolutely. to give you opportunities. I, I agree I think starting with a few and then branching off is, is a good approach like don't overwhelm with your goals but also have some reach goals too don't make it too easy you've got to reach out for a little bit too because there's other potential you just don't know absolutely so yeah so as karen was talking about there at the end like reach like don't be afraid to see what's out there um like craig was just saying the worst answer you're going to get is no or we can't do that um so then Karen was also asked, would Scott be as far along now as um, as far along as he is now without the transition teaming that occurred this school year? No, um, this is a huge, complex matrix. Um, you all pulled in not only all your expert resources here, but outside the community, the coordinators, the Bureau of Blind and Visual Services coordinator, the county, others came in and out, and it was just, I don't even know all these resources exist and what they can do, but they all came and were committed to, and it was just having all that communication with everybody, with the school, with me, with them, and Scott came in some of these meetings too. That was huge. I couldn't have done that so the short time really that we got all these things accomplished was because it was very structured, focused, and committed. Multi layered, and a lot of uh, responsibilities fell on the shoulders of a lot of people. And then finally, we asked Karen what advice um, she had for other teams who might be trying to engage in this more involved, deeper level transition planning process. Don't be afraid, be committed, um, and you have to have that sense of communication with everyone to keep it going, and you, you can't wait for others to do it. Everybody's going to help you on the way, but you really got to hang on strong and keep going and making sure everybody's going with you because once you leave the school, you're going to be on your own, so you need to make those other um, relationships with people that once that you step forth, you're going to be in an okay place and you're going to get to the next level where you need to be. So as you can see, Karen obviously came to feel really empowered to make decisions for her son's life after school and to then actually take the steps to achieve those decisions and those goals. Um, so that's the conclusion of our presentation. We hope that some of this information has been helpful and that you'll be able to take this back um, to your respective workplaces to try to enact this. Yes, a question? Okay, so the question was what programming do most of our children transition to after high school? It really varies um, because so many of our students are so complex. Um, it's, there's not really one, I don't, wouldn't say like majority necessarily. Um, the bulk, the majority of our students do as far as living um, setups go, I would say probably live at home for at least the few years after completing school at 21. Um, some may go to more of like a group home um, sort of living facility. Some of our students are able to be supported in adult day programs. Um, that's definitely one of our biggest challenges is finding adult day programs that are able to meet and to manage all of our students' needs, which is why we're really fortunate to that our school itself is trying to build a little bit of an adult day program. Um, but the other thing too that we found through this ITTI process is that 
maybe it's not just one thing that a student goes to, but a whole variety. So maybe our students have something that on Mondays they go with their hab aid out into the community and they volunteer as a greeter at a local store. On Tuesdays they go to a food bank and they help stock shelves. On Wednesdays, maybe that's a free day. Maybe their hab aid could take them to the pool or to a movie. On Thursday, something different. Friday, maybe it's a day off. So it, it does look very varied. There's not really a majority. Yes? So for those students that are looking at the students that the goal is more of adult programming or developing programming, what are some of, like, what does your transition grade look like for those students that are looking at the program and they're like, okay, I want to do this and I want to do that? What does that look like for you guys? And like, what are your services? Sure. So, um, so the question was just what does our transition planning grid in the actual IEP look like whenever we're talking about implementing these different programs for our students? So I'll let Craig take that one a little bit more as he is still the primary person who's actually filling that out in the IEP. Yeah, so that, that's actually been the, our biggest challenge is employment. Do you all agree? Um, that's why we're here. That's why we're here. What, what's the, yeah, what's the formula? It's still, it's still, and I honestly, a, a lot of times, and I still do it, I'll write at this time, due to the child's health and medical needs, employment isn't appropriate. We've talked to the, you know, the IEP team has determined that. So, you know, going through the, the training that I did eight years ago, um, that's what they suggested and, and really I, I didn't know what else to do so I think as we're and, and the ITTI model it's not going to be like it's it's not an overnight like success I mean we we fought and I like I've been in it since the, the beginning whenever Patton had asked us to do it and it wasn't easy it certainly wasn't but we've learned and we've grown from that it was a lot of hard work we put a lot of hard work into it and I'm as I'm sure you all do um, but the employment piece has been our biggest challenge because um, uh, it, we're still trying to figure out where OVR fits in or with our students because we have the most medically sorry we have the most medically complex we have those kids who um, traditionally going into the community people are like well you know we we don't know if we can give them a job they've got all these needs. So it really hasn't, some places, but not all. I'm sorry. I do, you, do you put anything in like the present level part of the transition of like assessment to demonstrate that like their skills level and their skills are like the same as goal is to where they're going to be going. That's going to help you and that's also going to help another agency who's going to come in and might look at that document to say, so wonder why they're putting in here, oh, here's what they're finding, here's data supporting. Because if you just report it by making a claim or writing a narrative, well, where did that come from? That's your judgment. So it's good to have data in there. So that's first and foremost, you should be putting data in there to back up that decision. So whether there's a lot of different types of assessments you can do, so remember, that you want to get summative data, formative data, observational data too. You get data from narratives. You get data from observing, observing your students and having a rubric to then dock how many times a certain skill is happening really well. How many times they've been in this certain environment and they really like it. That's where we want to put them. And so through that process then when you're going into, even if it is adult day program, find out you know, those, those youth might be living there, but are there going to be maybe jobs and tasks and things they're going to be doing, and how can we start to coordinate that partnership early before they graduate, a few years before they graduate, so then when they get ready to leave and go there, it might be a, a more seamless process. You've got to use your data to support those things. And so also I think to follow up on that is that we actually this year, for example, with Scott, we knew that he was going to be having this community-based work assessment. I was able to meet with the person who was actually completing this assessment. I talked to her and I said, what does he actually need to do to be successful out in one of these different settings? And one of the things that she said, for example, was it would be really great if he could be set up with something and then do it repetitively and then let us know when he was done. So for example, he actually had an IEP goal on the IEP that he graduated with this past June, 
that was just for that. So it was sort of more of like a task analysis style goal, looking at the task as a whole, that was where we as a school environment could actually work on real life training for employment. And so we really did have, even though he probably is not going to be somebody who's truly looking for competitive employment, we still did manage to really have like a pre-employment, a pre-vocational goal on the IEP that we as a school team could work on. And then similarly, we also in our present up levels, we report on things like the skills in the student apartment. We report on um, what they're doing in the print shop, what they're doing in these other sorts of vocational jobs that we're creating for them within the school. So that's another way that we do sort of meet that requirement of reporting on those different pieces. Do you find that most challenging, the employment part? Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, and because a lot of our parents, they're they don't even they don't see their like that's not even a goal sure. for them. Mm -hmm. So and the state, you know, like I think it's coming a little better, but they're always like they, you know, always you know working on this, working on that, and we're like the skill, like the skill, you know, the skill level, uh, and then the parents, like that's not what they're looking for. So we do struggle with that, and like what to put in and be okay legally in like the IEP. Mm -hmm. Right. That's fair. So that's, we were just trying to see what other people put in there because we also struggle with that. Yeah. And that, I think, you know, you guys were talking to, it is difficult to find employers, even for any kid, even with kids with emotional mental health disorders or anybody, you know, any, any student, you know, trying to find a job out of high school for the summer and stuff, you know, um, but you have to, even with your parents, you have to help them see, you know, the, this is the capability. Whether you do, vid, you, know, you do video vignettes and things like that of the student to capture, to then show your parents at your IEP meetings, be creative, where we're all sitting at a table, but if you're able to capture video vignettes and things like that where you can show a student, like she said, he, you know, he's doing this task, and if he's just stamping envelopes or putting the, putting the addresses on, boy, he, he might be able to fulfill a role at maybe my organization working in our, our copy center in the mailroom and you know, get paid a nice wage and things like that. So it's hard, but helping people to show the vision. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard, but anytime you can capture those, um, and that's another form of assessment too, you know, that you can, you can pinpoint off of too. But to be able to show them how that student can do and what they can do um, and not let their fears dictate their future and their decisions. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, and one thing to add to that, um, I, I, was a I was a child with a disability too, and I, I remember coming here three years ago for the first time, and I was in a presentation and they said, you know, and my son was young at the time, and they said, what's one thing that your child is good at then? And, and he has not. I know he has a side by side ranger that goes like 12 miles an hour, and he can parallel park that thing. I mean, he can't try to chew. But he, oh. <laughs> but he can parallel park his ranger between two poles, which I couldn't do, and I'm a good parallel parker. And so that really gave me, as a parent, and like hope that you know, he, yes, he might be able to drive a tractor and, and mow, you know, mow grass and things like that. So that's one thing I want to mention. But for you guys, um, I know obviously with waivers it's very difficult because there's no funding and there's no spots available. Um, I, and I work with kids or with kids with intellectual disability and autism, so I know that the PFDS and the community living waiver and the consolidated waiver are sometimes obviously hard to get. Do you guys have more luck getting those for your students, or do you have with the other with the Comcare and the um, OBRA? We. <coughs> No, <laughs> okay. we, uh, but that's where the, the one uh, note on one of the slides said be persistent. Yeah. And we have a hard time taking no as an answer. Um, so we then start to, all right, what, who do we then communicate with? Those offices, those legislators those people who make those decisions. Everybody agrees in here. I mean, that's, that's um, and we get, good, we get good replies back, but we get that, like, uh, we get the support that's, that's certainly needed. Um, but the attention, the attention and, and what we know, they need to know. And that's why they have you to do that. Right, right. I think also, also that key component of starting early and so if you're not waiting until the child is, is 20 or even 14 necessarily when all of this is starting, but starting as early as possible to get their names on that list, get them known to their support coordinators, all of that too. Yes? I just had a quick question. For, um, as a parent, I, I, I could see um, going to his school 
I could just see going to his school and having opposition in, in getting help because a lot of times the services don't know what each other does mm -hmm. nor care. Um, sorry to say it that way, but yeah. um, so as that, as that parent that convinced you guys to do it, like what should I do? How can I sell it? What do I do? Uh, <laughs> I, would get, I would contact, uh, what's up? Uh, oh yeah. Um, uh, the parent support network. I think you were in maybe some of the sessions. Yeah. Peel, uh, Peel, the Peel Center, P E A L. Um, and also your local Patton, P A T T A N. Have you worked with them before? Uh, or, your the, I, or, your or, or the IU, like Dr. Uh, Grimm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what county are you in? Oh, Delaware County. Okay, um, that's probably out east here. Okay, so uh, your IUs also, you know, we're local in the counties. And a lot of times we can come in and help facilitate a meeting and get just people like you can call a meeting and say, can we just get together and talk about what we all do? And then then pull up maybe parts of this process or the life course process and map everything out. Mm -hmm. So there are folks you can contact yeah. um, and it, that can help you to facilitate that that um, conversation meaningfully with confidence where you're not coming at, oh, what's this parent coming at us with? Yes. Right. Feel free to like, write down our emails. Yeah. Feel free to write down our emails and contact us. We'd be happy to like send an email to your group or community or something that you could then forward on to your school team or even like sending parts of this presentation or hard, like actual electronic copies of the different resources that we have. So then you could take those back to your respective groups to kind of show like, here, look, this works. And here's even a model that we can follow for it. So you're not reinventing the wheel. You're, you're going to get the crossed arms. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know. I can do it. It's my job. Yeah. I did that. Well, Whenever they came, you know, I was like, why would they, it's going to, you know, it's going to take over. No, you got to, they have to erase those those thoughts of, you know, your job's in jeopardy or, um, but it's the student, it's the child that's most important. That's the focal point, not your, you know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Well, they, like they, it's the, yeah, they love him. Yeah. Um, that's why they're in it, you know, but, right. you know, right. going the extra mile is like, uh oh, you know, three o'clock. And, yeah. And, and, and sometimes the ego's getting away. That's it. Yeah. The ego's getting away. Um, before we go on to the next question. Um, I just want to give folks the code who are waiting um, because I know some folks might want to get on the road. Um, please join me in congratulating this team. Um, outstanding job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.